right, good morning, y'all. Thanks for coming out. Welcome to our locations, everybody online. Such a joy to have you. I'm Jared. I get to be the senior pastor. It's a wonderful place known as Grace Community Church. For your guests, a special welcome to you across, across all of our campuses. Everybody online, love you. Thank you for joining us. We're in a series called Overflow. And if you've been with us, we, we're about three weeks in, and we're going to tie it up next weekend, so I hope you'll come back for that. What is Overflow about? Well, we'll get into that today some more. So let's pray, and we'll dig in. Lord, thank you. We love you. We need you. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will teach us through your servant, through the scriptures, help our unbelief, help us to receive. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Does anybody really like going to the dentist? Thank you. Thank you. And if you're a dentist here, I love you. All right. We're grateful you're coming. But just being honest, and I mean, to think about going to the dentist, this is, with me, it's just something about being in my mouth. I don't, I don't really like that. And they, when they bring out sharp things, I don't care for that as well. They go under the gums and they go around the teeth. And then I don't know about you, but I got a couple of teeth that are really sensitive. And somehow they park on those teeth and just scrape on that sensitive tooth. There's that. And then, you know, if, if you have something wrong and that hook hits you just right, then he's going to send you out of the chair sometimes. And I thought, that's often what it feels like coming to church, especially when you're doing a series on giving. Because you can come and it feel a little bit like the dentist chair, right? You come, it's, you, you kind of get checked in a way of where you are with the Lord in terms of your financial resources so it can become uncomfortable. And then again, you could also be, or also you could be very sensitive when it comes to the subject of financial resources and, and giving. So then it, it, uh, it, it rubs you the wrong way. But then again, they could also reveal that there's something wrong. There's something in your heart that's dark or something in your heart that's infected. And I know when I go to the dentist and I experience all of that, if there's something they find that's infected and wrong, I want them to take care of it because long-term what it could do. So in the same way, when we come together around anything regarding God's word, we want to be exposed of where, not just where we're sensitive or where we might be wrong or unhealthy and what God is after in that in our lives. So I hope, I hope you're not here today like it's a dentist checkup. I do hope you'll open your heart to what God has for us. Here's been the journey over the last couple of weeks. We began with understanding that Jesus said, Paul picked up on this in the scriptures, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. So that's how we've begun this whole journey, is it's blessed to be blessed, that God is the blessed God, says the scriptures. He is our source, and he provides all of our resource, our resources. The scripture says that there is nothing we receive on earth unless it has been granted to us from heaven. And so if, if you've labored really hard and sacrificed so much to get where you are today, just know that God kept you healthy. God's the one that kept your brain firing on the synapses in the right way. God puts you in environments where you would meet certain people for networking issues. Nothing came to you except from heaven. He is the source. We get to receive his resources. He's a giving God, and we get to receive. And then last week we talked about finances in the sense of banks collapsing and what does it mean for the economy and then what's that mean for you and me and inflation and I'm still stuck on the price of eggs and then there's the gas thing that's still a little high. All of this and it spooks us and so what we tend to do is get very worried, we get very anxious, we get very fearful and we begin thinking we're financial orphans instead of financial children of God, if you know what I'm saying. That through faith, through born again, we're born again in Christ and we're no longer orphans. We are children of God. Therefore, God provides. If we give to his heart, we're, we know he's involved to give to ours. And either way, he is a good, good father. God doesn't give to his pets. He gives to his children. Let me say it another way. If God gives to his pets, he will give to his children. He gives to the birds of the air, right? He provides the flowers in the field. How much more so, Jesus says, will he take care of you? So do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. He's got you. He will provide your needs. And now we're in this area today. It's been a journey where I'm to, I want you to see a different approach of what giving is going to mean for your life and mine. And if I was to sum it up as one big principle, here's what it is. That giving, giving is for your growth and for your good. Giving is for your growth and for your good. We often hear giving, we automatically 
get rigid or sensitive because we think of it in terms of God wants to take something from us or the church, here goes the church, wanted to take something from me. And that's not at all Jesus' approach to giving or the scripture's approach and what we'll see today. God wants to give to you. And he wants to give to you in ways that you will not receive unless you give. And so he wants to give. So giving is for you. Giving is for me. That's a game changer. Not taking from you or taking from me. And my hope always, and I, I don't know if I've done the best job of this over the years, is for you to always hear, even from me, that God is after something he wants to give to you, not just for you to give. And we're going to see some of that even today. So giving is for your growth, and giving is for your good. So I'm going to show you a couple ways of how giving is for your growth, and then a couple ways of how giving is for your good. First of all, giving for your growth is in this way. It's a test of your spiritual growth. Giving is a test of your spiritual growth. Giving is a test that you are indeed growing spiritually. It's like a litmus test if you follow the words of Jesus and the scriptures. And I'm just taking for granted that you want to be growing spiritually. I don't know if that's expecting too much, but I'm hoping you're all about spiritual growth. Now, if you're not a believer, this is a day you sit back and observe and hear, and I hope you keep coming back and asking questions. And if you're joining one of our campuses or online, keep coming back. But if you're a Christian, you ought to want to be spiritually growing because spiritual growth meaning, means you are growing closer to the heart of God. You are going nearer to him. You are, you are growing more in freedom in your heart and in purpose and in meaning and in nearness to him, experiencing deeper relationship with him and freedom in your lives. And, and, and all of us are all about, I know I'm all about spiritual growth. We're in a culture that's all about growth. Hashtag personal growth. By the millions, everybody wants, everybody's about personal growth, being the best version of yourself. How about the best God's version of yourself? And that's the spiritual growth truth behind it. This is something more than personal. It's cosmic, this growth. So giving is a test of your spiritual growth. I'm going to cover two chapters, uh, highlighting them over the next few minutes. 2 Corinthians 8, 2 Corinthians 9. It's a letter Paul has written, and of the entire letter, he devoted two chapters to giving. The context is that there is a church that is impoverished and suffering under persecution, and they have deep, deep needs. And there's this church called Grace Community Church Macedonia. You like that? And they have heard this need, and they have given overwhelmingly to meet the needs of these struggling people. So Paul is taking what Macedonia did that surprised him, and he's bringing it to Grace Community Church Corinth, and he's saying, let me tell you what Grace Community Church Macedonia did, and, and I'm going to call you to do and be the same. So that's the context of what's happening there, and let's pick it up. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. He says, we want you to know, Corinth, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. That is a loaded verse right there. There's so much going on there. So let's pick it apart a bit. He says, we want you to know about the grace of God. Notice he doesn't say, we want you to know about the guilt of God. There's no guilt that should happen when it comes to giving in our lives. He says it's the grace of God. In two chapters, we hear the word grace 10 times. Grace, grace, grace. Chiefly, if you are born again in Christ, the truth is you have placed your faith in Christ in his death and his resurrection. And the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2 says that it is by grace you have been saved, not of your works. Praise his name that we're not made right with God because we behave well enough or because we have given enough. We are made right with God through Christ by him giving us what we don't deserve, that we become children of God. It's that grace that ought to melt your heart and melt mine. That's where it begins. So he's saying they are grace dispensers. They are overflowing because of what's happened in their Christian life. He says this grace has been given. Now, it's a practical grace. It's a giving kind of grace among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of their devotion, are they truly devoted to Christ even when it comes to the financial areas of our lives? We can think we're obeying Christ and growing in every place and kind of put this one to the side. But he says, no, this is a place you're tested too. 
that their abundance of joy, their extreme poverty, have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. There's a lot of language that does not need, that doesn't seem they belong together. Abundance of joy, extreme poverty, overflowed in giving. They don't belong together. They do in God's economy. So when we look at it, an abundance of joy, think of this then as we look at just those few verses. A couple principles. It's experiencing joy is not based on your outward circumstances, but on your relationship with God, on your grace and the grace growth you're having with the Lord drawing nearer to his heart. And where you're tested when it comes down to finances in your life, where you can be tested or I test, I'm tested, is if we begin struggling financially and realize that my joy is missing because it's been dependent on the wrong thing. So this is growth that is not dependent on what's in my account. It's not dependent on how well my circumstances are and how healthy I am and how well things are going. No, there's a deeper joy. Even when tears fall, it's a joy that's there. And it's a joy in relationship with the Lord because of his grace at work in my life. And then that, having melted my heart, overflows in this generosity, which also tells us this, that money and joy are not linked to spending, but to giving. Money and joy are not linked to spending, but to giving. I think we know this. Now, don't get me wrong. I love spending. <laughs> I love spending on me. I love spending on gadgets and trinkets and updates. I'm with you. And if God provides that ability in your life. Enjoy. He's a good father. He blesses you. Just don't let it own you and don't let your joy depend on it. Because Jesus said last week to lay up treasures in heaven, not treasures on earth where moth and rust and thieves destroy. And we talked about how everything is infected. The, the clothes we wear, the car we drive, I got a minivan still hanging on for life. Everything's infected. The new iPhone, everything is infected with moth and rust and thieves. It, it's going to get old. It's going to break down. It's going to lose its shine. You're going to get bored. Your tastes are going to change. So he says, build your treasures in heaven. Let that be your gaze, the grace of God. Money is not dependent, or your money and joy is not dependent on the spending, but in the giving. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 8, 8. He says, I'm not commanding you, church at Corinth, to give, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of this other church in Macedonia. So he says, I'm not compelling you to give. I'm not squeezing you to give. I'm not pressuring you to give. He's saying, that's not what I want to do. He says, what I want to do is for you to see it as a test of your spiritual growth. This moment, a test of your love, and if it's truly sincere to the Lord. So money's like that litmus test. I can say I love the Lord, but do I obey him in every area of my life, including this area of giving? Do I truly love him enough that I would trust him in the hard places? 2 Corinthians 8 verse 3, for they gave according to their means as I can testify and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. So much here. They gave according to their means. So Paul is saying first, I knew their plight. I knew they didn't have a lot of means. So therefore, I was not going to put them on the spot. I wasn't even going to share the burden. I didn't want to put them in that place because they're struggling financially. And he says, though, that they gave even according to their means. Then he went beyond their means of their own accord. This is not something I asked for. This is something overflowing within them. And he says, they even begged us earnestly for the favor of getting to do this, not having to do it, getting to do it, of taking part in meeting those needs. So basically, they were saying to Paul, do not steal our joy from getting to give. When I was in seminary back in the day and boy scraping pennies trying to get by, I'd try to save up enough at the end of the week or the end of the month to try to go do a Chinese buffet. That's the place we'd go. So Buddy and I went to eat Chinese buffet one day and I know he was scraping pennies together and I was scraping pennies together. And this was our one moment to go out and splurge and eat all this Chinese food. And at the end, he wanted to pay for our meals. And I was like, bro, no, 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 because I knew he couldn't barely afford his, much less mine. And he said to me, Jared, don't steal my joy. 
Don't steal my joy. I, I think about that a lot. That's what they're saying. Don't steal our joy. Let us be a part of meeting these needs. I thought of it this way too. So I was a college athlete and being in, in sports, and even, even if you've played any kind of athletics on a team, you know this, that when you get injured, you do not want to come out of the game. You want to stay in the game. I tell my kids all the time, when you play sports, you're injured 99% of the time. You just got to push through it. You gotta, and you don't want to come out because you want to be there to help the team win. It's, it's awful to have to sit there and watch your team struggle or not be a part of the win. So what the church is saying to Paul is, Paul, don't take us out of the game. We may be injured in this financial kind of way, but don't take us out of the game. Don't steal our joy. Let us push through. Let us push through to contribute, to give in these ways. That's what God calls us to do as well. Well, let's keep moving. So the other part of that verse goes on to say this. And this, not as we expected, meaning they gave in such a way, wasn't expected. I was shocked, Paul is saying, that they would give in such a way. But they gave themselves, now here's the key, first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. And that's where it all comes down. The Lord is the first giver. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. There's nothing we get unless we have received it first from heaven. So what does giving look like? You go to the Lord first. You don't go to the pastor first. You, don't, you, you go to the Lord first, and you ask the Lord in terms of your financial life and giving, Lord, where is your heart? Where do you want me to follow your heart? I give myself to you first. This is worship. I want to worship you with everything in my life. And then out of that, from the will of God, to us, to the heart of God, to the work of God, to the mission of God. And we see it in Scripture chiefly as his local church and the poor, and we'll get more of that in a minute. So that's where it is. So let me ask you, is anybody here being tested right now? Amen. Being tested in your life in terms of spiritual growth? This is where you got to lean in and say, Lord, I don't want to be taken out of the game. All right, so giving is a test of your spiritual growth. Secondly, giving is evidence of your spiritual growth. Giving is evidence that you are spiritually growing. So let's watch it. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 7. Paul says to the church at Corinth, you are excelling, you're growing in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you. See that you grow in the grace of giving. So he's saying you're growing everywhere. You're growing in faith. You're growing in knowledge, meaning you're not just knowing the Lord in your mind. You're knowing him more and more personally and experientially in your heart. You're growing in love, loved by God and love for God. Just as you love to be growing in those places, love to grow in your giving. I haven't met a Christian yet who says, I've grown in my faith, but I've grown enough. I'm going to stop. I'm going to clip it right here. Grown enough in my faith. You know, I've loved growing in Christ and knowing and experiencing his love, but enough. I'm, I'm, I've grown enough. I've not seen anybody do that. But yet, how often we approach giving like that, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. So he's saying, just as you grow in these, in these areas of your life, we ought to have a heart that says, I want to grow in giving in my life too. This is what Paul is calling them to calling us to. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, here's another motivation for the heart. For you know, because you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Now, there are preachers out there that says, you know, you become a believer and trust the Lord enough, you got enough faith, he's going to make you wealthy and healthy. Those are lies. The Lord does not promise that at all. He promises riches that are greater than that, and that is riches in the soul, where you experience freedom and meaning and purpose in ever-growing ways and his presence and his power and his love within you. Now, there is, a, there is an outside aspect that God will bless you with, and we'll get to that in a moment, but it first begins in the heart of what Christ has done for you and done for me. I came across this quote this week. I'm going to put it on the screen. thought about this all week. You'll see how rich you are when you add up everything you have that money cannot buy and death cannot take away. 
I'm going to read that again. You got to pull your phone out and take a picture of that quote right there. You'll see how rich you are when you add up everything you have that money cannot buy and death cannot take away. There's nothing that comes to you except from heaven. And the Lord came to bring you those kinds of riches that can melt the heart and move from your heart. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 10. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. See, God wants what's best for you and me. Last year, he says to them, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. So he's saying you had good intentions, and you moved on those good intentions. See, good intentions aren't enough. We can leave. I know in my life I've had good intentions, but didn't really do what I had the intention to do. So we see it's very important to have more than good intentions. We are to act on it. And then Paul says it this way, now finish the work so that, you, so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. So it always comes back to according to your means. So what did he say here? He says, follow through on your commitment. So let me ask a question. Have you somewhere in your Christian life recently uh, or in the past, did you commit to give to the Lord, to give to his church, to give to his mission, to give to his work, did you commit and due to the financial climate, you've pulled back? Ah, you just found yourself stuck spiritually. This is the time not to stay stuck spiritually or fall back, but stay committed spiritually so God can grow you and how he will show up in your life. In, in very practical ways to provide for you and take care of you in the way that he is calling us to do so. Verse 12, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Now, what I love about what Paul is doing here, and this is, this is the big idea that I want you to hear in our time together. Paul is not after, and, and well, let me get to that next week. Paul is not after an amount. He's after the attitude. Amen. Paul is not after an amount. He's after the heart. And that's what I'm after today with you. The attitude, not the amount. It's the heart. Where's your heart? It's a heart issue. Giving is a heart issue. It's a spiritual issue. And I thank God. God is so wise that there's not an amount Think of it this way. What if there was 11 commandments instead of 10? And the 11th commandment was this. Thou shalt give $100 a week. Woo. That's right. Woo, indeed. <laughs> because I think a lot of us would go, woo, too. Because many of us would look at that and go, well, looks like I'm breaking the 11th commandment. <laughs> looks like I am not going to honor God and obey God with my life because I, I can't see that I can do that, Right? However, there's also some among us that would say, huh, wouldn't even miss it. Wouldn't even miss it. Wouldn't even know it was gone. That's all I got to do. So therefore, God says, it's not about the amount. It's about the heart. It's about the attitude that's behind the giving. So you're being tested in your spiritual growth. Is there evidence in your spiritual growing when it comes to this financial truth in your life? I think we all can grow. So that's two ways of understanding giving is for your growth. And then we see that two ways giving is for your and my good. First is this, giving increases God's generosity to you. Let's watch it. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Remember this, he says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. So this is farmer talk that God wants us to see in a cosmic perspective, not in an earthly perspective. So God's math is there's a correlation between what you give and what God gives to you. Think of it then in terms of seed. What if I was a farmer and I had a bag of seeds and I looked at that bag of seeds and wanted to hold on to them or was, was afraid to sharing any of them and I held it close and said, God, thank you for my seeds. I'm not going to give any, but bless my life. <laughs> Provide me crops is I don't share any seed. Well, that's not how it works. You got to pull some seed out. That's what God is calling you to. Then the generosity piece begins to happen and increase in your life. Or you give just two seeds, say, and you say, God, there's two seeds. Now bring me a great crop so I can take care of my family. Well, no, there's a couple seeds. 
A farmer throws the seeds out. You don't see a farmer ever saying, I don't want to give too much seeds in case I need the seeds back. No, the, the, the farmer gives the seeds because in the farmer's mind, he's not losing seed, he's gaining crops. So that's the mentality you got to have with financial giving to the Lord and his heart. So you give to the work of God. You get God involved in your finances. And as you give, God's promised to take care of you. So let's keep going to see this. Verse 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your own heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So each of you give what you have decided in your heart to give. It's between you and the Lord. You sit down with the Lord First, give myself to the Lord, then by the will of God to give, I sit down with the Lord and I pray and I seek, God, help me decide what you want me to give and I won't look back. That's what he's saying. So you decide in your heart and he says, not reluctantly or under compulsion. I love that. And as I've said, I've really, really tried to work out. I hope I've done a good, decent job of never, ever you feeling any kind of pressure from me to give and to give to our church, although I hope you do. That's why we don't pass offering plates around. You don't know how many church experts, when we tell them we don't pass offering plates around, their minds are blown. They're like, do you not know what more uh, giving you could receive if you pass plates around? And we made a decision a long time ago and said, we're not going to do that. We don't want there to be any sense of compulsion, squeezing out, putting you on the spot. We want you to worship, worship freely, that you get to do this. Yeah. So that's why we got money boxes in the back. That's why we have the online opportunity because we want it to come out of this a form of worship, a sense of worship that you've decided in your heart and your worship before the Lord. So not reluctantly, under compulsion, meaning that you feel squeezed out of it. For God loves a, a tearful giver? A fearful giver. No, a cheerful giver. Think of that. You know the, you know the original language and you know what the word is? Hilarion. What does that sound like? Hilarious. Don't you want to be so free in your soul that you live your life kind of like hilarious? You just have this free hilarity in your life that God's got you and things are good and he will provide. And then that overflow into hilarious kind of giving because he's got you. I want that for you and I want that more for me. And that's the promise that he's offering here. And this word love, he loves a cheerful giver. That word love in the original language is a different form of love in the Greek than all the other places. It means there's this, uh, this special attention. It doesn't mean God loves you more. It's not that. It just means there's like this special attention, this special kind of affection. Not on the amount you give, but on the heart in which you give it. That's what it all comes down to, the attitude, the heart that God looks at. That cheerful, hilarious kind of heart that he wants us to have in trusting him. So here's the thing to think about. I heard this years ago. That ought to be then, when you, think, when you consider giving and, and deciding in your own heart, don't sit down with a calculator. Sit down with the cross. And let that melt your heart to become a cheerful giver. Verse 8, and God is able, oh, listen to this, and God is able to bless you abundantly, that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, and their righteousness endures forever. You think the Lord's going over the top for us to understand his generosity to us as we give to where his heart is? All things, all times, having all you need. That's big, that God will increase generosity to you as you give to him. He will provide what you need, when you need it, and more so that you'll give to every good work. Dr. E.V. Hill, I don't know if you've heard of Dr. E.V. Hill. He's an old school preacher. He's one of my favorite dead preachers. He's in glory right now. The last time I saw him preach, he was sitting in a chair on stage with a mic in his hand and a Bible in his hand, and I thought, that's the way I want to go out. I want to preach so I can't stand anymore. I want to preach so I can sit in a chair with my Bible and a microphone. I love it, love it, love it. So when I watched him preach, here's one of the things he said, and there's a lot of that he said in sermons, but one of the things I've thought about a lot in terms of today, I remember in one sermon he said this. 
He said, if God can get it through you, God will get it to you. And he says, when God blesses you, he seldom has you in mind because he's blessing you that you might be a channel of blessing, that he gives you all, 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 so that it will flow through you for every good work. That's the call. Thank you, Dr. E.V. Hill. Good word there. Now, he mentions the poor and the righteousness that endures forever. So I have time to get into it, but when you look at the rhythm of Scripture of where there's giving, the giving is always toward, in a nutshell, the poor and toward the local church, the local church being the, the, the church, the storehouse that feeds you and feeds your family spiritually, and we see that. And I thought, I don't know, I, I won't say this is, I don't think I'd say this is prophetic. I think it's something just practical to think about. That's why I think any kind of giving that God stirs your heart about, you ought to lock in on a couple of places and not 20. Because if you're giving here, 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 you're not really invested. I mean, you can't keep up with everything that's going on there. You can't really see what's going on and enjoy the fruit of it. That's why I think it's great to lock in a couple of places. Now, there can be spontaneous giving at different times for different things, but I know my family, we've locked in on Grace Community Church. That's where our major resources go. It's back to the mission here. And then we have one other ministry we focus on that has to do with impoverished children, and that's where we focus on more than any. So I'd recommend that because we know what's going on at Grace. Of course, I'm the pastor. I, I know a little more. But also we know what's going on in this ministry and can celebrate and know and understand. So for what it's worth, something to consider. Giving increases God's generosity to you. Verse 10, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Now, who supplies? He supplies. It always comes back to the Lord providing. We're just returning what he's already provided for us. He who supplies this will then also supply and increase. If he can get it through you, he'll get it to you. Increase your store of seed and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. I came across this story and I thought it was terrific. Uh, nutshell, this young, young boy, 16 years old, very impoverished family, left home when he was 16 because he felt like his, his mother and father couldn't take care of him anymore. So he just left with the clothes on his back and had dreamed of starting a, a soap business in New York. And, and that's why it jumped out at me. It was New York. So when he left, he left as a young Christian teenager, and he remembered that his mother had instilled in him that for every dollar he made, he was to tithe on every dollar, to give a tithe, a 10% of his income first to the Lord, to the church. So it says when his first dollar came in, he dedicated 10 cents of it, 10 cents of it to the Lord, and he continued to do that, and his little business began to grow. And it said soon this young man had a partner in this soap business. The partner passed away. He became the sole owner. owner. So what he did then is that he instructed his bookkeeper to open an account with the Lord to credit one-tenth of whatever they made as a business to the Lord. The business grew powerfully, and it said as the business grew, the business then, then started dedicating two-tenths, then three-tenths, then four-tenths, and five-tenths. And it says that as that increased, or his sales increased in exact proportion to his generosity, and soon his brand name became known throughout the world, and you may know him by these, uh, these right here, William Colgate, through all this came about. So we see here in real time, in a big picture sort of way, about someone who honored the Lord first with their giving, and then how God showed up, increased more so that he could give more. What a principle. What a great truth. Now, let me think with you logically about this for a minute. As we're often hesitant with a hesitant heart instead of a hilarious heart, and understandable, because I think fear often holds us back more than anything, to give, Okay. In God's perspective, why would God, as we give, deplete us in our giving when we're giving to his mission? He's not going to deplete us when we're doing what, what, what his heart enjoys. Why would God hinder our ability to give toward the passions of his heart? That's why we know he will provide and he will bless it doesn't make sense that he would deplete us so that we couldn't give to him anymore. No, that's why he will continue to bless. 
So giving is for your good. It's for your good. It increases God's generosity to you so that you too can be generous. And then secondly and finally, giving assures gratitude to God and gratitude for you. Verse 11, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Enriched, meaning God is not out to take, he's out to give. In every way means giving is connected to your well-being, to your growth, to your good. It is more blessed to give than receive. And thanksgivings to God. Thanksgiving to God where there is no thanksgiving to God. That's what I love about the mission of who we are. God's called us to go in places where there is no thanksgiving to God, that we might reach communities and their struggle, their needs, their darkness, so that they're reached with Christ and through what we give to meet their needs. And then when there was no thanksgiving, there's now thanksgiving. And we get to be a part of that. And know this, we get letters from organizations and people and nonprofits that says, thank you, Grace Community Church. Thank you, Grace Community Church. Just know this, when they're thanking Grace Community Church, they're thanking you. They might know your personal name, but God knows your personal name. And he knows that when they're thanking Grace, they're thanking you in your personal name. He hears that. So thanksgiving to God. So there's no fear in giving. God is committed to his mission and you're giving. All right, your, your needs. Verse 12, for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. Now that phrase, the ministry of this service, what a phrase Paul just dropped in there. That is, that is a, a phrase that points to the Old Testament where the Old Testament priest would minister unto the Lord by bringing a sacrifice to the altar as an aroma pleasing to God, serving the Lord. So that means giving is spiritual. It's you bringing your finances, putting them on the altar of the Lord, whatever you've decided in your heart, whatever God has led you to give, you put it there as a, like a priest serving, ministering to the Lord as those finances are then used for needs in God's people. Verse 13, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. So this giving overflows, proving, proving we are who we say we are, followers of Jesus, obeying God's word, especially in the places that it's hard especially in a place of giving. Verse 14, and in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift in Christ. Yeah. So some takeaways. Where are you stuck in your spiritual growth? And you may say, well, I'm stuck in my faith or I'm stuck in my knowledge. I'm stuck. I would say, go to the giving first. Because it could be when you get unstuck there, everything else starts getting unstuck. Amen. So consider that. Secondly, maybe this week is to understand that giving is not being taken from me. It's, it's the, for, for my good. And that God has shown that if he can get it to me, get it through me, he'll get it to me. Maybe that's an area where you need to sit with the Lord this week and decide in your own heart, giving yourself first to him of how he's going to lead you, lead you to sow the seeds, as the scriptures say. And in that way, we can all know together, together and experience together that giving is for our spiritual growth and our everyday good. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We bless you. We praise you. Thank you that you are the first giver. Thank you, you are the one who first loved. Thank you that you are the one from whom we receive and would not have it unless it was granted to us from heaven. Thank you, Jesus, that you left the riches of heaven to become poor for us that we might be made rich. Thank you that we get to give. We get to, to needs and to your work and your mission and your heart and for your glory. Lord, I pray today is a day that we will bring our hearts to you so that you might have our whole heart in every way. In Jesus' name I pray. We all said amen. 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 All right.